Welcome to Start Writing. I'm Joe Bendoski. Today I have an interview with Jenna Morassi. She is an author tuber and she has been using Patreon very successfully. When I uh, did a poll of the various authors I knew, I asked those who were using Patreon or if they knew anyone who was using it very well and successfully. And I had multiple recommendations to talk to Jenna. She's our third author, uh, mostly because she was so busy I couldn't book an interview with her. Uh, but uh, we have an interview with her today, and we talk about just about everything from critiques to YouTube to what she's doing with Patreon. So it's a it's a fairly vast interview, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So here it is. All right, this is my guest, Jenna Morassi. Mor- Morassi. <laughs> okay. Uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself a little bit, Jenna? All right. Well, I am a science fiction and fantasy author, as well as a YouTuber. I have a channel on YouTube under my name where basically I give a lot of uh, writing, publishing and marketing advice to uh, fellow writers, as well as kind of explaining, you know, my own writing process, giving updates on what I'm releasing, what I'm up to, things like that. And then I've got I've got my books available. Um, my most recent release is The Savior's Champion, which is a dark fantasy. Um, it was released in late April, and it's the, the response has been amazing, and I am so very pleased with okay. how everything's going. <laughs> so is this part of a series, is, or, and is it like the beginning of a new series, or is it in the middle of a different one? It is the start of a new series. I am currently working on book two. Um, it's the Savior series. So the first book is The Savior's Champion. Um, the next book is The Savior's Sister, which is what I'm working on right now. And I'm on chapter 14. So I'm about halfway done. So we're just with, with the first draft. <laughs> yeah, with the first draft. <laughs> Not halfway done with the process. Just, the, yeah. just draft number one. So, okay. Um, so as I was reading on your site, like you've, you've pitched yourself here as sci-fi and fantasy, mm-hmm. but on your site, I noticed you mentioned romance as a big heavy genre. So is that like, are you writing romance in a different genre or is there just heavy romance in your books? It, it, talk to me about that uh, element of your bio. It's um, involved in in my books. Uh, the dark fantasy, I, if I were to uh, pitch the long version, I call it a romantic fantasy adventure um, because the, uh, the story follows a man named Tobias. It takes place in a world that's very similar to ancient Greece or Rome, and he's competing in a gladiatorial-esque tournament, and the winner of the tournament gets to marry this magical holy queen. Problem is, Tobias isn't really particularly interested in the magical holy queen he is actually interested in someone else and so um the romantic aspect of the story directly ties into the plot so okay. it's more than just a subplot it's kind of a co-plot it's half violence and bloodshed and murder and half you know swooning and loving <laughs> so okay so what's the what's the tagline for the book what's your like one line amazon advertisement um, the, the two that come up most are, um, you're a good man, but you will choose the darkness. Those are some, uh, words of wisdom for Tobias while he's in the tournament. And it's a, a very, a very big, uh, deal in the story, um, because he's, you know, this good guy participating in this tournament that's considered, uh, very, uh, uh, holy and righteous. And he kind of decides to, take a different turn and do something that his society considers very blasphemous and wrong. Um, And then the other one, which kind of mirrors uh, that tagline is respect the labyrinth, obey the labyrinth, which the tournament um, part of the tournament is referred to as the labyrinth. And so they're kind of navigating this tournament and, you know, they're, they're heralded as gods, you know, to the outside world. All the people who are watching the tournament, they see them as celebrities and athletes, but really they're kind of being um, oppressed by this tournament. And um, really, in a way, they are like slaves to the tournament. It, you know, they have to do exactly what this tournament tells them to do. And it, he's kind of seeing another side of the spectacle that no one else gets to see and no one else really knows what's going on. Okay. All right. So, 
um, that's that's your new release. Uh, mm-hmm. What did your other series or other books that are out? As if this is a new vein here, right? This is this is the new one that came out in April. Uh, my first novel, my de- debut novel, was Eve: The Awakening, which is a uh, science fiction adventure. It's a new adult book, so it's targeted mostly to uh, college age folks, and it takes place in the future in a college setting um, with a girl named Eve, hence the title, um, who is kind of a new breed of human. She is telekinetic, and uh, her species is discriminated against and it's just her navigating college trying to fit in and uh be accepted by the human majority and everything just doesn't go according as to plan you know everything goes awry and things end up being a lot more dangerous than she thought that they would be (laughs) to put it simply all right. So the big thing we wanted to talk about with you is Patreon. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, so because I don't know a lot of authors are doing it. So we, we when I actually put out a blast on I think it was 20 books to 50K and mm-hmm. I got multiple recommendations to contact you. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I, 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 inter- I interviewed a few other authors that uh, that were also doing Patreon. Um, but uh, so I, I want to know why you've chosen Patreon as a platform what you're doing with it as opposed to, you know, email list building and the other standard marketing tactics mm-hmm. and uh, just, just the whole Patreon approach and what's working and, and, and what didn't like, what are the things you've tried with Patreon that just blew up in your face? Definitely want to know what those are. So we don't try them ourselves. <laughs> of course. So um, originally I had heard about Patreon a long time before I started using it and I didn't really want to use it because, you know, you're, you're setting up this page, and you're saying, hey, help support me and my craft. And for me, there was a little bit of a pride element. And it's kind of like, oh, I, I don't, I don't want to set up this page. I want to earn my money. I don't, I don't want to feel like I'm accepting charity from people. So I was really turned off from the idea for a long time. And okay. I only I only warmed up to it because a bunch of my readers started messaging me saying, Hey, I'm trying to find you on Patreon and I can't find you there. Huh. Where's really? your platform? Yeah. And I was totally surprised. And I realized that um, after talking to these people that I kind of had the wrong perception of what the platform's about. It's not really, you know, it's to me, I had seen it as more of like a GoFundMe. It's, it's not really about that. It's definitely a platform that's geared specifically toward creators. And it's just, sort of a way that uh, their audience can help to support them while they're growing their platforms. Just a, an extra line of support. And in return, they get special offers and special gifts and treats and things like that. Um, because I think most of us know that it, being a creator is, it, it's a little bit difficult, especially when you're just getting, when you're just starting out. Yeah. Um, it's not the easiest thing to break into, especially financially. So it's just a way for your fans to be like, Hey, I can give you a buck a month, you know, and in return, I'm getting extra content. I'm, I'm getting a uh, more connection with someone that I'm a fan of. So once enough people started hounding me about it, I, I set up uh, my Patreon page mm. and, I, and I'm really glad I did because I've really enjoyed it. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like having another social media presence, except it's smaller and more intimate. And um, it's, Usually if I want to ask my audience for advice in terms of what they want to see from me, what additional content they want, I go straight to Patreon and I ask them first because, you know, these are these people who are supporting me. I want to make sure that I'm providing the kind of content that they want to see. Um, In terms of things that have worked and things that haven't, um, I think especially um, I see this the most among authors on Patreon and sometimes artists. Um, But I think people forget that um, if they are following you on Patreon, if these are people are supporting you, it's because they're already a fan. They already like what you're doing and they just want to see more of that. And I see a lot of authors sometimes overanalyze it 
And for example, I'll see a lot of authors where one of their reward tiers is to write handwritten thank you notes um, once a month to all of their patrons, which is a very kind gesture, but that's very time consuming for the author. And that's not um, the most enticing reward. A lot of patrons would rather you just give them a sneak peek at what you're working on. You know what I mean? Because they're, they're a fan of you and they're a fan of your books. They're a fan of, um, for, in my case, it's my books and my YouTube platform. So if I were to give them a sneak peek into some of my videos, that is going to perform a lot better than say a handwritten thank you note. So I think the key is to focus on what you're already doing, what they are, because that's why they're a fan of you in the first place, and just give them a little bit something extra, whether it's early access to content or behind the scenes access to content or connecting directly with you. For example, one of my tiers is a, a live stream with me where I will live stream directly with my patrons and tell them what I'm working on and I will answer all of their questions. Um, that's a really popular tier for me because these people are a fan of my videos and they're a fan of my books and that they have questions and now they have that one-on-one -on -one access. So I think so long as you are providing them a deeper look into what they're already interested in from your platform and a way to connect directly with you, it's going to be successful. It's, it's going to do well. Okay. So one of my questions was going to be, how do you build your audience? But based on what you're telling me here, you're not actively trying to build that audience on Patreon. Rather, you just have it there for those who want it. Um, it's kind of a little bit of both. I already had an audience before I uh, developed my Patreon presence. Um, but I do find ways to remind people because not everyone is, is looking to Patreon and not everyone knows this page exists. So for example, an e a really easy way for me to both uh, fulfill my Patreon reward tiers and also advertise my Patreon and remind people, hey, this is, this is available to you, is um, one of my tiers is a suggestion box where if um, they donate a certain amount of money a month, they have access to a suggestion box where they can suggest what topics I cover in my videos. And if I uh, select their suggestion, the video is dedicated to them. So I will start off the video by saying this, you know, video, this topic was dedicated, is dedicated to so-and-so. They are one of my patrons over on Patreon. You're awesome. Thanks so much for dedicating this. Or thanks so much for suggesting this topic. Then at the end of the video, after I've dedicated it to them, I've gone over all the information. I remind people, hey, if you want a video dedicated to you, follow me on Patreon. The link is listed below. So quite often, fulfilling the rewards is a, a way to actually advertise that this platform exists in the first place. So every time yeah. I, I do a video such as this, a dedicated video, I instantly get more patrons. Another thing is when I do my live streams, I'll announce on Twitter, hey, I'm doing a live stream just for patrons. I will automatically get more followers, things like that. So quite often just fulfilling the reward will you know, bring more people to the page. Yeah, that's kind of a good idea. <laughs> okay, so uh, as far as retention goes, do you do anything actively to manage the retention or is just maintaining your, your content output taking care of that for you? Um, it, it, it's kind of hard to say because with Patreon, some people, especially depending on the tier, it completely varies. For example, if people are in the lower cost tiers, like... Um, there are different reward tiers where you get different yeah. rewards available to you. For example, the $1 tier, if people are in that tier, they're usually there for good. They don't really leave, you know, they, they're, yeah. it, because it's, that's a really cheap tier. That's really easy to do. Well, and you don't even notice it every month. <laughs> Right, exactly. You know, and, and that's kind of one of the nice things about Patreon for both the, you know, someone like me and the patrons is that they're getting this additional access to the creator and it's only costing them a dollar. So it's nice for someone like me because it, it's, it's incentive to a lot of people. A lot of people can afford a buck a month or $12 a year. Um, and it's incentive to the patrons because you know, that's, that's really cheap and they're getting all this additional access they wouldn't have been able to get before. But like I was saying, if they're in the $1 tier, they're usually going to say, you don't see a lot of, uh, 
issues with retention in that regard. If they're in a higher tier, for example, I have a $50 tier. That's not something that people are going to be able to afford, you know, for the rest of their lives or even for a year. Yeah. So, so when it comes to that tier, that's where you will see the fluctuation coming the most. But I, it, it's, strange. And I don't know if this is just specific for me and my platform, but I, I don't have a problem with like, for example, if I lose two $50 patrons, I will get two or three more pretty quickly right away. So it's never, it's never like a concern if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's because my $50 tier is a reward that is in high demand. So for me, really? r- right. My, my tier is, uh, critiques. I offer a uh, 5,000 oh, critique for the, you're 50- critiquing their work. So yes. that makes sense that it's kind of a revolving door. If someone exactly. gets a, that manuscript ready, they mm-hmm. sign up for the tier for probably just a month mm-hmm. and then they pull out, huh? It's only for a limited word count because, you know, I, it, you know, it could take me an entire month to critique a full manuscript, let alone, yeah. you know, a ton of manuscripts. Um, so it is a limited word count, but yeah, um, I have some people who every month religiously, they've got something that they want to have critiqued. And then I have some people who are like, okay, I can only do this for a couple of months. Um, and then, you know, and then I'm out, but you know, like I said, there will be someone who will fill their spot, you know, within a few weeks. Um, and, and that, that's another thing, another good piece of advice, uh, is just, you know, be aware and pay attention to what your audience is asking of you. I get critique requests on a near daily basis, you know, people asking me to critique their work. And that's why I set up this tier is because, you know, yeah. people are asking for it, just give them what they want. Well, not only that, but I mean, mm-hmm. 50 for 5,000 words, it's actually a decent price. <laughs> that's, that's a really right. good price for editing right there for critique work. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's what I thought. So I figured it yeah. was fair. So, but, um, but yeah, I mean like a, a lot of people sign up for that tier more than I was expecting because, you know, I mean, it's $50. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, it's kind of a revolving door. Um, whenever someone leaves, someone else, you know, fills their spot really quickly. So, and I think that's because, you know, it's, it's something that's actually in demand. Whereas yeah. sometimes you see $50 tiers and it's, it's cool. And it's like a lot of great perks, but is that something that a lot of people in your audience is looking for? Right. Well, and I, you even have to ask the question, do you even want a lot of people? Cause I mean, like this, this, this uh, critiques, you mm-hmm. probably want to have a hard limit on that just because you're like, you know, I could, I could spend my whole month critiquing if too many right. people sign up there exactly. and I won't get any work done on my exactly. books. Yeah. So well, fortunately, Patreon does offer like a cap. Yeah. So if it ever gets to the point where there are too many critiques to do in a month, you just put a cap on it. And I see some people, it's like, okay, I'm only doing 10 or I'm only doing five, something like that. I haven't yeah. had to do that. And there are some people, which is, I mean, I'm very flattered, but it's a little mind boggling, I guess. There are some people in the $50 tier who, and there, and there are a lot of people on Patreon in general who just are there to support you and they don't really capitalize on the rewards. So there are some people who will pay the $50 and be like, I don't have anything for you to critique this month and eh, I'll do it next month. And I'm like, wow. Okay. Thank you. You know, it's, it's flattering, but at the same time, I'm like, that's your hard earned money. Let me do <laughs> something. Just give me a sentence. You know? <laughs> That's funny. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So I, I, this is, this feel free to ask me to cut this part from the interview, okay. but uh, how do those critiques go? Cause like, I, I, I mean, I'm in various critique groups and whether it be online or in person, there are some people's work who I dread going through. I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. Um, it's funny because before, long before I had a YouTube channel, when I was just getting started and I just had a blog and no one knew who I was, the way I was trying to get myself out there is I was offering free critiques and, um, uh, you know, just as a way to kind of like expose myself to the writing community. And uh-huh. oh my gosh, I read some, I read some special stuff. Like I don't, I don't know. It, I read some really bad stuff, like the kind of stuff that makes you go like, oh man, I don't think I can, I don't think I can help this person. Um, So when I opened up critiques on Patreon, I was 
I was a little worried. I was like, yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's going to be more of this and I don't know how I'm going to be able to help them. But I think, I think when there is a price on something, um, you're less apt to get the people who are just sort of frivolous about it and like, Oh, mm. you know, I'm going to write a book because I really like anime or, you know what I mean? Like some people, they're yeah. just doing it because they saw a cool show and they want to duplicate it. Um, since there's a price associated with it, you're more apt to get people who are taking it seriously. And so fortunately, um, the manuscripts and excerpts I've had to critique via Patreon have all been promising. I mean, obviously there's varying degrees of skill level and there's varying degrees of some people, you know, are further along in their process than others. And sometimes if I'm critiquing a fifth draft and it's very clean and sometimes it's a first draft and it's, you know, got a lot of mistakes, but fortunately everyone, there's promise there. There's, you know, skill and you can, you can see what their vision is. And so yeah. I've, I've never had a situation where I'm just like, Oh my gosh, this is too much. It's always like, okay, like maybe clean up the grammar and punctuation, but we can work with this. We can turn this into a beautiful story. <laughs> you know? So, okay. So how, how do your uh, Patreons react to your critique? So for a while on the podcast, we, we were taking submissions oh, really? and I'm pretty sure after I critiqued their work, I never heard from these people again. <laughs> Like I, and I, I warn people over and over again, be like, it does not matter how good a writer is. It does not matter how good your story is. A critique's purpose is to find what's wrong. Exactly. Right? You know, exactly. that's, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I would send these critiques back to these people, never heard from them again. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I just lost a listener. <laughs> pretty sure. You know, and I mean, and I never saw any terrible stories. Most of these people were actually very good writers. Mm -hmm. um, but I was offering a critique, you know, it's right. If you send me something for tr critique, I'm going to go over it till I find something to critique. Right. And uh, I feel like it just was crushing to them. And I mm -hmm. try to prepare people. I'd be like, you have to understand. We are trying to find something that's wrong, you know, it's so we can fix it and make it better. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and even if you decide not to go with the suggestion, at least it was there. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas opposed to if, if I just hand it back and say, this was awesome. Well, I've just wasted both our time. You know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, well, in terms of my experience, I've had experiences outside of Patreon. I have like a, um, an ask box on my blog and sometimes people will submit questions and sometimes you can tell when there's a way that the question is worded and you can kind of tell that they're expecting a pat on the back mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not that person, <laughs> you know, like if, yeah. if, if I hear a story idea and there's a problem with it, I'm, I'm going to say there's a problem with it. And I have, you know, upset a few people in the past, but it's not beneficial to, to lie to these people. You know, if, if, I lie to them about their story, then it's just going to be even more crushing once they release <laughs> it or once they get to an editor. Like someone, yeah. someone has to, you know, tell them the truth. Um, with Patreon, I have had a couple of people get a uh, very, um, emotional. <laughs> I, I don't even know if that's the right word. Oh, I, I have had one person get very emotional about it. And, um, and I was kind of surprised because, um, the story wasn't bad. It, it just had, um, uh, some, some writing issues, like some grammar kind of issues. And I just emphasize that this, you know, really need to work on the grammar and punctuation. There's sentence structure issues, things like that. But the story itself wasn't bad. And, and in terms of my critiques, it was one of my least harsh critiques that I've given. Uh, but yeah, they didn't, they didn't take it very well. And so there weren't any more critiques after that. And then there was one person or there, I think there have been a couple of people who I sent, I send the critiques back and they just don't respond. And yeah. Really, they just don't respond. Yeah. And you're like, well, I crushed that person's soul. Right. And, and, you know, I feel bad because obviously like I've received criticism and stuff and I know that it's hard to hear, but if I am, you know, seeking it out, you just kind of have to brace yourself. Like with, with my critique yeah. partner, when I get my manuscript back, I am like braced and like flexed and ready. Like, okay, like my body is ready um, because I'm expecting there to be criticism and it's not nice to hear, but that is why I sent it to her. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I'd say 80% um, of the time, the response is really good. And um, I've had people who I 
pointed out a lot of issues with our manuscript and I'm thinking, Oh man, they're going to like, they're just going to immediately bounce out of this and they're going to hate me forever. And they will write me back. So thankful. Like, thank you so much for pointing this out. This is so helpful. You explained it so clearly. And it's a relief because my intention is not to hurt anyone's feelings. My intention is, yeah. to help them, you know, achieve their dreams, you know? So, so that's always a relief when they, when they take it really well. And most of the time they do. Okay. Yeah. That was just a question I had there. Sorry. <laughs> we just had a huge tangent there, which I said, I'm, I'm probably going to pull just because it's a really big <laughs> tangent, but I just wanted to, to ask how that was going. Okay. Well, so well, I don't mind, honestly, like I, <laughs> I get it. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So retention. Okay. So how did you decide, on your reward tiers. You're the third author I've talked to about this. And um, one of them, Thorn Coyle, she had mentioned that in initially she had a bunch of tiers with a bunch of rewards. And she said after a couple months, it was just exhausting trying to fulfill all of those, those mm-hmm. promises. So talk to me about how you set up yours. Um, I, well, I poll my audience a lot. I post lots of polls online and I ask them, you know, specifically what they want. So that had to do with it. Also looking at, uh, you know, you got to do your your research. I researched a bunch of other, um, really popular platforms on Patreon and I was seeing what kind of rewards they were doing. And there was actually a reward that I wanted to do. Um, that's very popular, especially among YouTubers. Um, and, uh, Unfortunately, it wouldn't be very helpful to most authors, but I'm an author and YouTuber, so it's helpful for me. And that's to be able to um, have patrons see your content early. Um, So basically, like my patrons would get to see my videos a week early. That's something that I really wanted to do because that's a very easy reward to fulfill because I have to make this video anyway. Making it anyway, yeah. Unfortunately, when I first started my page, it just wasn't really um, feasible because. uh, my fiance has a lot of health problems. So sometimes, you know, something his, you know, neuropathy and health problems will flare up and I'm not able to film that week's video until the day before. So it wasn't super feasible. So I, you know, kind of fiddled with it and looked for other options on different platforms, what they were doing. And one of it was, um, instead of, you know, showing your videos early, give them early access to your book, um, and what you're working on. So during the release of TSC, um, the savior champion, the, my book that just came out, um, I was giving them early access to character portraits. I was giving them early access to, um, the chapters, to scenes, um, world building, things of that nature. Um, but now that TSC is out and now that, uh, my fiance's health has improved, I'm most likely going to be tinkering with my tears a little bit and I will oh. probably do the, the YouTube early access to videos as a replacement because I, TSC is out. I don't have any early access to show them. So you, you got to fill it with something. Um, but yeah, I think there are easy ways to, um, to think of reward tiers that, that appeal to your audience, but don't take up too much of your time. Like I said, I, I all see like the handwritten notes. That's going to be really, really time consuming. You know, there, whereas a live stream once a month, that only is, you know, like an hour of my time once yeah. a month and people really love that. So whereas <laughs> the, the handwritten notes would have taken me forever. <laughs> so I, I do have a question. How are you doing that live stream? Is it like a Facebook that you're doing? Oh, I just do it through YouTube. They have oh. a live stream feature and then you just um, look at the- it as unlisted. And so only your patrons can see it. And oh, there's okay. also a live stream feature directly through Patreon. I just, I don't know if it's still in the beta phase, but I tried it out when it was in the beta phase and I didn't like it at all. So I just, okay. oh. all right. we'll so there. talk to me about what hasn't worked. What, what's blown up in your face? <laughs> I think when I first started, uh, like I said, I was very apprehensive about Patreon because it felt like charity. And so I really wanted to make it worth everyone's while. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to like post something on Patreon every single day. I'm going to be like super active and I would spend a lot of time, like, especially with the behind the scenes, uh, TSC content, I would spend a lot of time like preparing, you know, world building charts and character maps like that to like be like look at all this behind the scenes content and um people did engage and they liked it but it took me a while to realize that I was getting just as much engagement on the stuff that took me two minutes to put together so I was kind of (laughs) I was kind of yeah I was like basically wasting my time and Uh, most of the people are there because they're a fan and they want to support me they're not there 
because they're like, okay, I want to make my $1 worth it. Like give me hours and hours worth of content for my $1. So I think for me, I just had to rein it back. There was a moment where I was like, okay, I don't have to really be wasting this much time, you know, trying to make it worth everyone's while. They're not really going to be visiting my Patreon page every single day, you know, just like, you know, something fun once a week is fine. You're good. Just chill out a little bit. So calm down, basically. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And uh, so I guess finally, how does Patreon fit into kind of your overall author business? Um, For me, Patreon is sort of my reinvesting platform. I make more money off of my books and off of YouTube um, than I do with Patreon currently. Um, So Patreon is not, you know, my primary platform, but I use it um, to reinvest into my business. So through Patreon, I have been able to purchase lighting equipment, a new camera, a microphone. Um, I've been able to... uh, purchase um, character artwork for um, the cast of my novel, um, which was requested by my patrons. So they were. Yeah, that's great. That. Where can I find that? Yeah. I, my artist is called pocket size super villain. That's no, no, no. I'm, I'm <laughs> like on your web page, or, or oh, Patreon um, page. I'm like looking for it here. Oh, if you go to my website, it's all available on my website now. It's jennamoresi.com. And then you click on the TSC tab. Oh yeah. I see it. Yeah. You just hover over it and characters pops up. Yeah. And so I was able to get 20 of the characters done. It's Holy a big... cow. 20. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which was awesome. It's a, it's a large cast. There's actually 35 characters, but I got the 20 most important. And um, Holy cow. How long is this book? What's your word count? It's 170,000 words. Oh, it's like two books. It's a big book. It's a hefty, hefty book. But you know, This uh, is, I, I think this character artwork is genius because like when I was reading the Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. I got about halfway through the first one and walked away from the series until the TV show came out. Mm-hmm. Then I finished the whole first season knew who the characters were and read the rest of the books. It's really because, helpful, especially with a large cast. It's yeah, just nice to, because to there's it. so many people you have to, you know, kind of keep yeah. tabs on. And there's only so much as an author that you can do because you don't want to be like, and then O'Brien entered, by the way, O'Brien is this guy. <laughs> like in case you forgot, you can't really you yeah. can't, you can't keep doing that, you know? So yeah. it was nice having the artwork. And plus, you know, my patrons requested it and, it that it was so much fun for me. This is something that I had always wanted to get done is, you know, have someone create my characters. So I love that. That was one of my Yeah, favorite, that's super cool. And and like I thing. said, it just definitely really helps you helps you differentiate the characters when they're on scene, having just that visual. Exactly. That's so, great. So that's pretty much what I use Patreon for is the money that I get from Patreon, it goes straight back into my platform. So you know, and that's one of the the selling points, you know, to my audience is, hey, I I want to deliver the content you guys are asking for. You guys asked for character art. You guys, you know, asked for more videos and different kinds of videos that I can't do without this kind of equipment, you know. So if you want me to cater to you, you know, you can support me on Patreon and it'll make it a lot easier for me because, you know that's, that's what it's for. (laughs) So, so that's pretty much what I I use the platform for. Okay. So have you finished all the characters or are you still like rolling those out? Oh, well for TSE is out and I just was getting, you know, the main kind of the primary cast for TSC. Um, once uh, the companion novel comes out, I will be getting more portraits done for the new characters that are, uh, that show up in that book. Awesome. So, okay. Uh, sorry, a little sidetrack there again. That was, that was just really cool. And then I'm glad you were able to do it. That is so awesome. Okay. Thank you. So one thing I did notice is uh, you label yourself as a cyborg and then that's what you call your patri- patriots? Pat- patrons. Patrons. Uh-huh. And uh, I just want to know where that idea came from. It seems like clever branding. Like that's just good <laughs> branding right there, right? Well, it's it's that's true. It is good branding. But it's funny because um, this is kind of the story for a lot of like 
shticks and things that have happened with my platform. But the cyborg thing, that was just my nickname in college. Um, uh, what? I'm, Why? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a combination of things, but it, it <laughs> it's mostly because I'm smart. I'm, you know, really kind of nerdy smart. And um, also, I'm not the most... Um, I guess you could say emotionally expressive. Like I'm not monotone or anything, but I'm like the, I'm the person who I will be friends with you for five years and you've never seen me cry or angry or like lose my cool, I guess. I'll get like really excited and happy about stuff, but I just, I I guess when it comes to like vulnerable emotions, I'm not super expressive with it. So, so my so friend, I'm assuming it was girls who gave you this <laughs> this no, nickname because like actually, that's just like how all my guys' friends are. Be like, yeah. It was actually my guy friends who really? gave me the nickname because I guess they expected since I'm a girl that I would be, would be more emotional. More, yeah, I guess and it it would become like it it came to a point where it was like if I did have a bad day I'd be like man I'm having a bad day. They're like you can't have a bad day. You're a cyborg. Like is maybe there's <laughs> programming. And so another nickname name um i had during college was spock so which i guess is kind of <laughs> relevant to it but yeah um it just was one of those things where it stuck everyone called me cyborg in college so i jokingly mentioned it on uh, my channel a few times and then it stuck and so now i am yeah. oh, and and they started calling me the cyborg queen so now i'm the cyborg queen which is very flattering um and so the people who watch my channel they're like oh i'm a cyborg too and I'm like okay cool it really it's just weird because it all stemmed from you know jenna doesn't cry and she gets really good grace so <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny that's, that's really where funny. it all yeah because like even i was like well it's like it looks like really good branding but when you mentioned that the the fantasy is going to be a trilogy but it's like it feels a little off as the, <laughs> the fantasy is going to be a bigger part of her writing at least for a while Right, but, right. But yeah, that's it why it wasn't necessarily planned out that way. It just, right. It wasn't like a yeah. oh, sci-fi author, cyborg. Like, I don't I don't write about cyborgs. I mean, like, I don't really know much about cyborgs or anything like that. Yeah. It was just my nickname in college and it became a running joke with my friends. So I mentioned it a few times on my channel. But like I said, that's happened with a lot of stuff. Like uh, the way I introduce all my videos is the same. And that's like, it, it's just, I just say hello, everybody. I go, hello, everybody. And I did that in a couple of videos and it became this thing where everyone's like leaving comments. Hello, everybody. And so now it's a thing. And now I have shirts that say it. And it's just, it's weird because you, you do these things not thinking about it, you know, not thinking anyone notices or cares. And it's just something you do and it becomes a thing and a t-shirt and a mug and I don't now I have cyborg army shirts and cyborg queen mugs and it's it's crazy I don't yeah know. that is crazy okay mm -hmm. so I have a few so my other question is you just mentioned your your shirts and your mugs so you have merchandising yes, I want to know where you got the idea mm -hmm. how uh, you're marketing it and is is it is it even what is it worth the time you've invested into it because you have created a ton of designs right <laughs> and and slogans that you've thrown on these things mm -hmm. um well starting with how i got the idea my fiance cliff would always joke with me about the little cash phrases and things the cyborg army cyborg queen another one is but jenna which you know. yes i was going to ask you what is but jenna about um, okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into that. I'll, I'll go back to the merch in a second. Um, so when I first started my channel, I would, you know, make, I make, I give writing advice, right? And I would always get these comments that were kind of like nitpicking on little things that I kind of assumed were common sense or, you know, you, things that I didn't mention in the video. And they would always be like, but Jenna, what about, you know, X, Y, Z? <laughs> And so I started, and it started to irritate me because it was always an aside that, you know, wasn't really relevant or was nitpicky or something, something that I would consider kind of dumb. And um, I started to get annoyed. And so I would predict what the but Jenna was going to be for a video. And I started including it in the video. So I'd be giving a, advice on um, outlining or something. And then I'd be like, uh, but Jenna, outlining stifles your creativity. Like I would mimic the comment I was about to receive and then I would <laughs> give a sassy rebuttal to it. And it was just my way of trying to like, you know, get those sort of comments to stop. But it ended up becoming 
like people's favorite parts of the videos is me like sassing these imaginary commenters. And so now it's in most of my videos, I'll have like a but Jenna moment where I imitate what something stupid someone's going to say. And then it's my rebuttal kind of being sarcastic about it. Um, so that's where but Jenna came from. But Back to the merchandise, um, my, uh, Cliff would always joke with me like, oh, pretty soon you're going to have mugs and t-shirts and things like that. And I would just kind of laugh it off like, oh, that's cute, funny, yeah, whatever. Um, and then uh, it was just like with Patreon, like, where's your Patreon page? People would write in saying, "Where, like, where's your merchandise? Like, most YouTubers have merchandise, where's yours? And it wasn't really something that I had considered um, like I said, I just kind of took what Cliff was saying as joking, you know. So the, the merchandising came more out of being a YouTuber as opposed to being an author. Yeah, it came more. I mean, I consider myself an author before I consider myself a YouTuber, but most YouTubers and um, there are there are actually a lot of authors on YouTube as well. They all have merch and whether it's um, book related merch or platform related, I have both because, you know, I've got books and I got the channel. Um, but a lot of people were just ex kind of expecting me to have merch and um, a lot of people would comment saying, I want but Jenna on a shirt. I want hello everybody on a mug. Um, and I was kind of like, really? <laughs> you do? Okay. I mean, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of um, the payoff, it, I personally, of all my ventures, like everything that I've got going on um, to, you know, support me financially, merchandise makes the least amount of money because um, you know, it's, I, I have it through cafe press. So you just kind of get, uh, they, they handle all the shipping and manufacturing and everything. Yeah. So you just kind of get a cut of it. Um, however, of everything that I've had to complete, um, you know, for my, uh, platform, it took the least amount of time. It was so easy to set up a merch store. I mean, it was completely free. It didn't cost me anything. It took me maybe a week. And so now every week I have a guaranteed paycheck that I essentially didn't have to do anything for except for that or not every week. I'm sorry. Every month yeah. I have a guaranteed paycheck and I didn't have to do anything except for that one week, however many months or years ago. Yeah. So I definitely, I mean, if, if the demand is there, I recommend it because like I said, it's really easy and quick to set up. Um, and then you're, you always got some money coming in from it and you don't really have to worry about it. However, Again, it's if the demand is there. People were, ex, you know, explicitly requesting but Jenna mugs and um, other slogans and things like that. So you give the people what they want. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So I have a few other questions, just kind of tangents as I've researched you and, sure. and been talking to you here. So uh, one of my questions is you mentioned that this book is targeted at uh, college age kids. So outside of Facebook ads that let you target specific age groups, how are you reaching that audience? Um, well, my first book was targeted at college age kids. Uh, the Savior's Champion is pretty much 18 and up. It's just any adults, which includes college age people, obviously. Um, the easiest way that I target these people is with YouTube. It's um, one of the reasons I decided to go that route. My audience on YouTube is primarily, um, I have to, I have, I have to check the exact age range, but it's like 18 to 35. It's in that age range. So most of my audience are college age people or my age. And um, it, it was kind of the perfect way to advertise to them and market to them as well as, you know, providing a service to them, you know, helping them with writing advice and whatnot. And um, so, so that's pretty much how I did it. I did use Facebook ads for my first book and like they were fine, like they did okay, but nothing has benefited my platform more than YouTube by far. And then I, I guess I was going to ask you about your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So you YouTube about writing, mm -hmm. how, how is the conversion rate of that over to readers? Um, in general with YouTube and I think I've talked to a lot of people who um, who are an author plus something else, like an author and blogger, things like that. Um, in general, uh, it's it's not going to be like a lot of people think they're going to start this YouTube channel. And for example, I have one hundred and thirty four thousand subscribers. A lot of people assume that means 
my first week I sold 134,000. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, that's, that's not how it works. You know? Um, I would say like, you, you, I'm trying to think I, could, because it's a little hard to tell right now since I just released a book. So it's the, the busiest time, you know, my right, yeah. really well, really well. Um, so it's, it's a little hard to get the data there, but I would say, um, there's sort of the passive audience. There's like the big group of people who they subscribe and then they just watch maybe a couple of your videos that can, for most YouTubers that can account for like half of the audience, like 50% of the people who subscribe to you are not loyal. They just liked a couple of your videos subscribed and then they go off and do their thing. Right. Um, so you're mostly looking at half of your audience. And I would say of that half, half of mine. So like 25% of my audience becomes a reader and a follower of, you know, my books and things of that nature. And then wow, that's a good conversion rate. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. I like it. <laughs> and then uh, the other 25%, they're just there for the, for the writing advice. I, it's hard for me to say in any exact measure, because like I said, I just released a book. So that's when, you know, the numbers are surging and whatnot. And then things kind of die down a little bit as time goes on. Um, but in terms of, I'm, I'm looking mostly at, um, uh, interest in my videos about my books and things of that nature. Um, and in terms of the views and whatnot, I would say like a quarter of my audience shows interest in, you know, the books, right. Or the videos where I talk about, you know, what's going on with the savior's champion and things like that. Um, sales and, and whatnot. And then there are the people who are just there because they want the free writing advice, which is fair. That's, you know, a big chunk of my platform as well. So, yeah. Okay. So I was just curious about that. I'd say ours is maybe 10% or less mm -hmm. that's converting over. So, and we're a podcast and we release audio books. So oh, really? we, we actually thought we'd get a better conversion, but you know, if it's not their genre, it's not their genre. Well, that makes sense to me because like with my first book and my, and it, like I said, it's really hard to tell because I just, you oh, know, the release yeah. just happened. But with my first book, 10% sounds about right. With this one, uh, my first book was a little bit more niche. And then with this one, it's a little bit more broad. Um, and, uh, you know, more people have expressed interest in it because it's fantasy. Um, so I've had a lot more success with this one. So it could have something to do with that like genre and things of that nature. Also, my audience is 10 times bigger. So, you know, yeah, well, and I was going to say that like you, your book was written for the age group of your audience. I would say most of the people listening to podcasts are younger. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who buy my books are over the age of 65. Oh, really? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's kind of a, opposite ends of the spectrum right exactly and that that's kind of another thing uh, my my channel is like not safe for work that makes it sound like it's sexual or something it's not it's just like <laughs> i curse a lot. Yeah. yeah and um and i'm just kind of myself and myself is i'm straightforward and to the point and i like you know potty humor and things like that and so that also kind of helps because uh my like for example my my dark fantasy novel like it has a romantic element but it also has graphic violence you know that has you know people dying and blood and brains spraying across the wall it has guys cursing and things like that so it kind of uh helps in that regard like if you are interested in my personality and you're okay with adult humor, you will probably be okay with uh, what I write. Uh -huh. And also it kind of helps because a lot of um, YouTubers uh, who are writers, like YouTubers in the author tube community, most of them write young adult. And um, obviously there can be cursing and whatnot in young adults, but it's not as, you know, extreme. It's sort of like the, the, the PG 13 version. And so, um, they kind of have to cater their channels to that particular audience, you know, a younger audience with me. It's not as big of a priority to me, you know? Yeah. Because my books are not for 13 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, so I guess, how are you doing marketing in general? I was looking at your books. Uh, so it looks like it's about a book a year is your release rate. And you are doing really well as uh, for for releasing at that you know at that time period for only having the two books out. I'm looking at your reviews. You've got over a hundred on each book, uh, mm -hmm. very well reviewed. So how what I mean? What is your marketing plan? It is awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so. 
Um, I'm, it, it's funny because um, everyone always asks me about analytics and SEO and keywords and things like that. I, that is not my forte. Um, I did, I do have a business background. I went to school for business. Um, I know a lot about marketing. I was a stockbroker before I was an author. So a lot of, <laughs> yeah, like it's pretty. I big. guess you're a cyborg, so it makes sense, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so I do have a lot of experience in that regard. So the business marketing area for me is a little bit second nature. This is stuff that I'm used to. Um, but in terms of like the technical stuff, the analytics, um, I don't really like pay as much attention to that. Um, for me, it's just, it's mostly been about building my platform and my brand. Um, you know, it's been about, you know, my channel. And like I said, like the, the image, image that I project to people, I'm just being, you know, my authentic self. And I think that I, I know it sounds cheesy, um, but I think when it comes to marketing, um, people, especially on YouTube, people respond to authenticity. They respond to people who uh, keep it real and don't seem phony and fake and stuff, even if it rubs people the wrong way. Like, obviously, there are people who don't like my language on my channel and things right. like that. But a vast majority appreciate that I'm, you know, just keeping it real and I'm being, you know, straightforward with them. And um, a lot of my audience trusts me and they know that, you know, I'm I'm going to tell them the truth, even if it's it's not always pretty. And I know that seems like that's not like a marketing tactic, but it's what helped make my um, channel so popular um, is just being authentic and honest. And um, that has done more for, you know, my marketing than anything else, because now I have this large platform where when I release a book, I have the ability to tell 134,000 people, Hey guys, I'm releasing a book. This is where you can buy it. This mm -hmm. is how you can get involved, you know, because I, I built this community essentially. Um, so for you, your marketing plan is basically your YouTube audience. It sounds like that, mm -hmm. that's you, it's something you just build and maintain independent of the books themselves. And you can release to it when you're ready. Um, sort of, yes. I mean, YouTube is definitely my main marketing platform and my main sort of like hub for, uh, you know, all of my readers and whatnot. They, they come to my channel. Um, I have an author website. I do, um, marketing on Instagram, all the social media venues. I've got a fan page and Twitter. Social media in general is just, I know so many authors who are very anti-social media, I, really? How yeah. are they surviving? Right, exactly. I don't get it. I mean, I understand because it is irritating to maintain, it's but annoying. social media has, I mean, just sharing a pretty picture of TSC on Instagram, I will immediately get sales. And it's like, how are you not doing this? This is not, this is, this is the easiest thing an author can do. And it, you know, and it actually works. So all of my social media platforms have been super helpful in that regard. Um, but also just, um, I think I'm really hyper organized and I'm the kind of person who like, who plans everything and creates a schedule. So when I, when I released TSC, I had a very rigorous, uh, release schedule and marketing plan. Um, I had content available to my audience every single day. Um, not necessarily on YouTube, but like on all of my platforms. Um, I had games that I was playing with, with them. I had, uh, created a hashtag TSC Tuesday where every Tuesday I would answer any questions they had about the book. Um, and wow. that just, it gave people an, the ability to ask questions and, you know, get involved and talk to me, but it also advertised TSC to a bunch of people who had no idea what it yeah. was. And, um, obviously, um, submitting for ARC reviews and things of that nature. Um, I, I give out free copies of TSC to other YouTubers, booktubers, author tubers, oh, bookstagrammers, yeah. all, all of that, <laughs> sending out free copies all over the place, just, you know, in return for honest reviews. I had a street team and I think the biggest thing that helped, and this is something that a lot of authors, um, uh, do, but I don't think enough do. And I think that everyone should do it is I had a, a pre-sale giveaway. Um, and that was just to incentivize people to pre-order the book, you know? Um, and pretty much, uh, I had three grand prize winners. Um, and now I'm, I'm not saying that every author should do these 
prizes specifically because I'm in a unique position where a lot of right. people donate cool stuff to me that I can give away to my fans. Um, but I had these really big prize packages, including signed hardbacks, uh, mugs, candles, bookmarks, um, merchandise, <laughs> yeah, just a bunch of stuff, right? <laughs> T-shirts. And, um, and I had, you know, hundreds of people, uh, pre-order the book just so that they could, you know, get access to these prizes. And I think what's important with these giveaways is people know that a lot of people are going to be entering. So they know that their odds of winning are slim. So you have to, everyone needs to be able to walk away with something just for pre-ordering. Like you have to give some kind of consolation prize that's worth it. A lot of authors I see giving away swag packs, which is basically like bookmarks and paraphernalia and like postcards that have your book on it. Um, swag is usually like, like business cards. That's stuff that most people put in the trash. So to me, that's not really a good consolation prize um, to encourage people to enter a giveaway. Um, I think authors forget that they're pre-ordering the book so they can read your book. So they're, they're interested in the book. So in my opinion, a better consolation prize is to give them a teaser of the book. You know, I already have the first three chapters of TSC available on my website. Everyone who pre-ordered a copy got five chapters. So they get a much bigger chunk of the book and you know, they're, they're, that that's a better incentive in my opinion, because they want to read the book. So here's some, you can, you can read a little bit before it comes out. And I think in general, that kind of incentive is both um, obviously really helpful for, in terms of marketing for the writer, but it's also a nice way to say thank you to your audience. You know, these are the people, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't get to do what I love as a job. So I want to, you know, cater to them and give them something that is going to make them happy. And that's an easier option than mailing out a ton of bookmarks, you know, and licking hundreds of envelopes for all yeah. these people. So, okay. Uh, just a couple more quick questions here. I know I've, I, this is about an hour. I'm trying to hit, hit the hour mark, but, uh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so, so talk to me about booktubers. I've heard about them, but what is it exactly they do? Are they just doing book reviews in YouTube? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Booktubers are, I'm, to be completely honest, which will sound odd because I am an author tuber and the communities are considered link. I don't watch a lot of booktube. Um, so I'm not as well versed as some other people are. Um, okay. But I know about it because I have, you know, friends and acquaintances who are booktubers with so pretty much it's book reviews on YouTube, as well as um, like things called book hauls, which is where they literally just show their audience what books they bought. They'll be like, I went to the bookstore and this is what I got. And like, look at the pretty covers. They'll, they'll talk about covers that they like, covers that they don't like, just like bookish aesthetic kind of things. And also they'll do book unhauls or anti-hauls. I'm not sure which one it is, but it's basically they'll go through their shelves and talk about which books they're getting rid of because they didn't like, things like that. Um, and there are some booktubers, you know, who have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And then there are some who are very small, um, but very passionate about what they do. And, and most of booktube, not certainly not all, definitely not all, but a good chunk of booktube is really focused on young adult. Uh, novels, mm, which was, okay. which for me made it a little bit difficult because TSC is not a young adult novel, but um, it, you know, that you just kind of have to go through and, and see, you know, what everyone's interested in. And most of the booktubers, even if they're sp mostly interested in young adults, they'll still be open to other genres and things of that. Right. Nature. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's also Bookstagram. I don't know if you're familiar. <laughs> Bookstagram? Bookstagram. Not yeah, at all. It's, so, um, although I don't do much with Instagram, mostly mm -hmm. because I can't do it from my computer. I have to use my phone, and mm -hmm. it's just so annoying. I like, agree. <laughs> you know, I've got my mouse. I have a full keyboard, you know, all my files, everything. T mm -hmm. Touch of my finger, super easy to access. They're like, no, no. We will not let you do that on your computer. You have to use your phone. I'd be like, how ridiculous are you people? <laughs> you know, I tried a couple emulators on my computer, but I couldn't get any to work well with Instagram. So I was just like, you know what? This platform's a hassle. I'm not going to deal with it. Yeah, sometimes I'll just 
like plan my posts on my computer and then just send them to my phone and post them because I'm the same way. Like I'm a very fast typer. So for me, everything on the computer is just easier than I have to do on the phone. I'm like, Oh, I don't want to do this. But bookstagram is really popular as well. It's basically people who just take really pretty pictures of books. They take really pretty pictures. They're very popular. And then they, they'll review it in the, in the little uh, description and, um, and then also bookstagram or bookstagram, Instagram kind of has a, um, what's it called that, that I can't remember its name, that other app that's really popular with the little ghost icon. They kind of have the same idea as them, um, Snapchat, where you can post little stories that disappear. Bookstagrammers will post stories, opening books that they've gotten and like, Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sending this book to me. Or they'll review books and their stories, things like that. So I sent TSC out to a bunch of bookstagrammers and it's awesome because now you have these gorgeous pictures of your book. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's genius. Yeah. So, and and they're like, I don't know how these people do it. And I used to dabble in photography and I still look at their stuff. I'm like, how do they have these setups? It'll be like flowers surrounding the books. They're so gorgeous. But um, now I have all these beautiful pictures. They share it to their audience. I will repost it onto my page to my audience, which um, just incentivizes more bookstagrammers to post even more pictures of your books because they're like, oh, wow, she's sharing my content. So, you know, it's kind of like, yeah. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, that's a, I mean, if you ever decide to get into Instagram, that is a, <laughs> that's another good marketing. Uh, when they let me use it on my PC, I will get into Instagram. <laughs> Someone told me that they changed it recently and you could use it on your computer. Oh, but- maybe I'll check it out. Cause this was, I don't know, five, six months ago that I was messing with it. And I was like, I would, so I would, I, w- I was using a social media manager and I would have it mm-hmm. send a bunch of stuff to my phone, but then I'd forget to click on it or it's been like 10 minutes, like just clicking post over and I was like I hate Instagram (laughs) (laughs) you know I mean I understand some people live on their phones and so they do Instagram I'm not that way why like I live on my laptop like like my phone does like three things Mm -hmm. phone calls text and audiobooks that is what is my phone is for anything else I would rather have a computer and I own a laptop so I can take that with me Exactly. No, I, I purposely, like when I buy a purse, I will bring my laptop to make sure it fits in, it fits in there <laughs> everywhere. Like I, yeah. and I don't like using my phone. Cause like I said, I'm very fast at typing yeah. and not with my phone. Like I just using my thumbs. I can't, I can't. Yeah. Well, not only that, but like, like the autocorrect on phones is crazy. Right. <laughs> and it's because the buttons are so small. It's so easy to miss hit a button. Mm-hmm. And then even if you spell what you want to spell correctly, if it mm-hmm. doesn't fit them, they'll change it. Right. And then you have to go back and be like, no, no, I was right. <laughs> you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, yeah, that's like 100% accurate. And honestly, I really like Instagram just because for me, I mean, I'll just keep it real. I like Instagram because I like seeing all these pretty pictures of my book. I'm like, oh, look at a TSC covered in flowers. But yeah. um, actually using it, no, I don't. I don't enjoy it so much, <laughs> but it yeah, gets so the job done. Maybe, maybe I'll check if they, if they're, if they're letting me post stuff from my computer, then I will, I'll probably start using that social media <laughs> platform again. But I was just, I was so frustrated with it, you know? And mm-hmm. uh, so, uh, okay. Yeah, that was great. So I've actually, I'm probably going to do a couple interviews on these different formats here. Uh, I did have a question. So I saw that you had a book trailer now mm-hmm. as a YouTuber, I guess that makes a big sense. Are you using that book trailer anywhere else with success? Uh, what kind of research went into that? Like, so, oh, so this is just something I've been kind of trying to research lately. I had a book trailer done. I worked on it. Mm-hmm. I loved it. I got feedback on it. According to the author audience, it's terrible. So what? then, so since then, I've been trying to figure out, okay, what did I do wrong? Mm-hmm. And how do I use this tool? And so I'm, I'm kind of collecting that. So that's my question to you. Well, in terms of the book trailer, I, in, in general, I'm just like going to keep it real. I think, I, I can't think of a, actually, I can think of one besides my own, of course. I can think of one book trailer that I've seen that I didn't feel sucked. Like I see so many, even book trailers with, you know, traditional publishing with the big five, some of their trailers, oh my gosh, are just so bad. And I understand the point of it, but the whole, you know, it's to obviously get people excited, but 
if it's not a good trailer, then I feel like most people will spend their time talking about how much the trailer sucked. Like, for example, there was one book who was uh, traditionally published um, with the big five. It's a very, very popular book. And the trailer, I, I was researching for my own. Um, I checked out the trailer. It's got a lot of views, so that's great. But almost all the comments were all about right. how much they hated the narrator's voice and how her uh... voice was horrendous. And I, I kind of felt the same way. I was like, wow, this is this is a really bad voice. And that's wow. what all the comments were about. Um, so I feel like if you're going to, I, I feel like a book trailer is not a necessary thing. Um, it was, it made sense for me because I have a YouTube channel. Yeah, like I know definitely. lots of I know lots of people who make uh, book trailers or have book trailers made and then no one watches it because they they don't really have, you know, a, a YouTube presence or anything like that. It's it's kind of weird for their fans to look there, I guess you could say. Um, I've used my trailer on, you know, all over the place. I've used it for uh, media kits. I've used it on obviously Twitter and social media and stuff. Um, but if it was something where it was expensive to make or um, I wasn't on YouTube, I probably wouldn't have bothered with it. It just made sense, especially because I was using that book trailer to announce the uh, cover and release date of my book. So I wanted to do it in a very theatrical way. And I was uh, announcing a giveaway with it. Um, and my uh, fiance, Cliff, actually made the trailer so it was completely free for us we, right. you know, well and we so my brother it. owns a film company and we made the trailer together mm -hmm. um but i think that's part of the problem i wrote the book he'd read the book uh -huh. and when we made a trailer like most people when they saw it they were like i'm a little confused about what this is about and i think we just knew too much going in uh-huh and that's yeah maybe that's what it was that's where uh we really bungled it was we we the, the, we're too deep into the story in the trailer trying to get people's interest mm -hmm. that they walk away not knowing what's going on because they didn't have the context we did. So You know what might help if you do it again next time, especially if your brother has all access to this stuff because then it's free and, you know, it's like, what have you got to lose? Um, what I did is I basically scripted everything that was going to be in my video and I just sent it out to like 15 people and was uh, like, does this make sense? Do you get what's going what on here? So like, I never got feedback on the script. I wrote it. I mm -hmm. sent it to him. He gave me a few notes. I revised it. And then that's what we went with. We should have gotten outside feedback from people who would never read the book yeah that's what i did i was in a, a writing group and i was just kind of like hey here's here's my script does this make sense is it intriguing do you want to read the book and then mo uh, most of the scripts i think i ended up changing it three times but it was because of like my own you know neurotic tendencies but most of the suggestions were honestly the tiniest tweaks like change this word to a different word and then suddenly it sense you know it's always just something really small and trivial and it's like you said it's because you're so close to the project that it makes yeah. sense to you you know yeah so okay yeah so i was just trying to i've been trying to get feedback the problem is i've, I've talked to well i should say i've contacted about six or seven authors and all of them were, their responses were well i didn't really know what i was doing with my trailer <laughs> and since i've made it i kind of don't know what to do with it i was like i need to find some at least three or four people who know what they're doing mm -hmm. and have had a positive use in it so that I can understand the tool. Well, if you do decide to do a trailer again in the future, like I said, just write the script and have a bunch of people read it. And like I said, they, they literally just pointed out the tiniest things, the tiniest tweaks, it, literally like a word here and there. And it made it so much better. And then, um, and then, you know, we made the video, what we did to gain traction on the video was, like I said, we used it as the cover reveal. Like if you want to see TSC's cover, you got to check out next week's video. And it was uh. also the reveal of the release date and there was a giveaway surrounding it. So since it was the cover reveal, a lot of people do giveaways with their cover reveals. It was the same deal with me. I had a link in the description of the video to um, like the Imgur file of the cover and it was like if you share the cover you are entered into the giveaway and you could win a prize i can't remember what the prize was yeah but, but they could win it so you know <laughs> they could, but they could win it That's so funny. if 
if you attach a giveaway to something like a book trailer, automatically you will get more views, which in turn makes it, you know, more visible on YouTube and, you know, yeah. more useful to you. So, okay. And then uh, my last question is Eve, the awakening is paperback mm-hmm. only. Why? Yes. That was because I published it a really long time ago, <laughs> and this was uh, it was uh, my first venture into publishing, brand new debut author, and um, all I really knew about was Create Space. And oh no, it's it's available in paperback and ebook, but it's it's not available in hardback. Um, well, no, because like I'm on all your, your page here. Oh, never mind. There was a Kindle option. Oh. So yeah, because I was like I was on your author page and it said paperback only, but when you click on it then there is a Kindle option there. Right. Oh, that's for um, the signed copies. Is It's available in paperback for signed copies okay. on my website. Well, no, because I, like, I just clicked on like your author page on Amazon and oh. it only listed the paperback option. But when you click on it, then it then well, that's weird. options. Like, yeah, that <laughs> is know. weird. That's a that that's an weird. Amazon issue. But yeah, yeah, no, it's available in paperback and ebook. Um, okay. So. Oh, and my, one other question. The the price of the savior. I'm super curious about this. Six twenty nine, like not six ninety nine, not five ninety nine, six twenty nine. What is that choice about? It, it's it's six ninety nine, and sometimes Amazon puts them on sale. Oh, it's on a little mini sale right <laughs> yeah. now. That's why I'm like, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, so, okay. you're actually not the first person to ask me that, and I remember the first time someone again. Asked, yeah, I guess the, what the, are you the pro- talking about? The problem is I'm looking at your author page, not the book page. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, it, it's six ninety nine, and they just put it on sale. <laughs> okay. But the first time someone told me, I was freaking out. Like, did I mess up? What did I do? And I looked. I was like, oh no, no, no. It's just, it's just on sale. So if Amazon did that, you still keep the same royalties? Yeah, you keep okay. the same royalties. Okay. So, hey, whenever I see those sales, sometimes they'll be like, hey, guys, it's on sale. Go buy it now. You're going to get it cheaper. So <laughs> might as well. Amazon did a little sale on it. That's odd. <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> yeah, they do it all the time. So, um, hey, <laughs> whatever works. Yeah. I, well, I mean, at least, the, I mean, you're high enough in the algorithms that they're that they're doing stuff with your book to promote it. So that's a good sign. Right. Yeah. It was really exciting because right when TSC came out, people were emailing me saying that they were getting advertisements in it for their Amazon newsletter. And I was like, oh my gosh, it just came out. So that was, that was really, really exciting. I was super happy about that. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's been a good run. (laughs) It's been working out well. So, Cool. All right. Well, that's everything I had. Is there anything you wanted? Uh, I guess uh, we need to remember to do a shout out to all of your your sites and, and uh, pages and whatnot. Anything else you want to cover before we do that? No, I, I think I think that's good. Just, you know, like you said, a shout out to. OK, my- yeah. So let us know where we can find all of your stuff. I am available at YouTube. Um, dot com slash jenna marassi um why don't you, available- why don't you spell your last name <laughs> oh yeah it's it's kind of a tough one it's uh m-o-r-e-c-i um and i'm available all over social media under that name jenna marassi look for me on uh facebook twitter instagram tumblr it's all under the same name i'm super easy to find and you can uh find my newest release under the savior's champion um, by Jenna Moresi. It's available all over. You can get it at Amazon. You can get it in the book depository, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, whatever. It's everywhere. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so uh, much for having me. It was yeah, super fun. This was great. As always, thanks for listening. That is the end of our uh, podcast, so it's time to start writing. If you want to contact us uh, about questions or write in or make a recommendation for another episode, you can reach us at jbendoski at gmail.com or you can go to the official uh, site, which is uh, joseph-bendoski, b-e-n-d-o-s-k-i.com and then uh, backslash start dash writing and uh, from there you can contact us as well and uh, view all of the episodes and articles uh, about the discussions and marketing episodes and uh, thanks for listening